born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, March 27, 1917. What was your family name originally? Well, as I understand it, my uh, the family name in uh, Lithuania was uh, Charney, C H A R N Y, uh, which is taken from the Russian Charney, you know, mm -hmm. butchy Charney, dark yeah, eyes. Yeah. So it's black, uh, is the English um, translation. And then I had the, my father was. Uh, the youngest of seven brothers, and uh, when the oldest brother came to this country, and that must have been about in oh, around 1890, I imagine. Uh, between 1890 and 1900, I've never really researched that. He decided that the name was inappropriate for a. Uh, person of his stature, or whatever it could mm -hmm. have been, and uh, he decided that the name Schwartz, which was the German mm -hmm. uh, version, was a much more dignified name. At that time, Germany was uh, uh, certainly uh, intellectually and economically and socially considered the most progressive mm -hmm. country, in, uh, in, uh, certainly in Europe, continental Europe. And that's why, apparently why he took the name. Did he change it to when he came into the country? Oh, yeah, yeah, right, at, right at, at Ellis Island, right apparently, right. or during the immigration procedure. Mm -hmm. So there were two other brothers that followed him, one uh, Morris, who eventually ended up in Muncie. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, when he came, he took the name Schwartz in the same way. And my father, who was the youngest, obviously, had two older brothers here, and uh, he did what he was told to do, apparently, and uh, because I have his naturalization papers, and he was naturalized as Leo Schwartz. Did any of the family come over as uh, uh, Cherney? Under the Cherney name, well, there are several uh, other branches of the family uh, that came over under that name and uh, still retain it, mm -hmm. but... Uh, not in the line that I'm from. Mm -hmm. We're going back uh, three generations. Now, what about your uh, father's family? Do you have any information about them? Well, they were they were Jews in Lithuania, mm -hmm. uh, from what I have reconstructed. Uh, my father's father, my grandfather, was a um, sort of a general merchant, uh, particularly in lumber. Mm -hmm. Lumber seemed to be the, um, the business that Jews could uh, engage in. Uh, mm -hmm. Lumber, hides, uh, and sort of uh, anything. They were they were uh, in all kinds of businesses. To, because, of course, they were restricted uh, mm -hmm. when they uh, lived in the Russian Pale. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Baltic uh, area was always famous for naval stores back in well, the 16th that, century. Well, yeah. that's, a, that's a good point, and, and apparently uh, some of that came into it. However, I could research that. Uh, I have uh, cousins who are older than I am, by the way, living in both uh, the East Coast and the West Coast. The uh, children of other brothers who never migrated to this country, mm -hmm. and uh, they would—they might have some information on that. I, I really am not equipped to say much more about. Mm -hmm. it. I, I simply don't know. Do you know anything about your uh, uh, grandmother on your uh, the grandmother's family? You, know you mean you mean about oh on my father's side? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only thing I know about her is that her family name was Grabowski, mm -hmm. and that is a family that uh, uh, came to Philadelphia and uh, was in the tobacco business, and they are the developers, of the original developers of the El Producto Cigar, <laughs> and apparently were a, a well-known Philadelphia 
my family and my father had some contact with them. They were second or third cousins on his mother's side. But Grabowski's a Polish name, right? Well, <coughs> I'm not. I'm not too good on uh, etymology mm -hmm. and, 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 and names. Um, I, of course, all these names were taken. You know, the Jews didn't yeah. have family or surnames right. uh, until Napoleon's time. Right. So most of these names were acquired during the Napoleonic era, and uh, people assumed names that uh, was either close to their professions or their looks. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe the Charneys were all very dark complexion. Yeah, probably. Uh, I do know that there's another branch of the family my father had told me about, um, the Goldstein which, uh, family, which, uh, of which there was a well-known judge, Jonas Goldstein, in New York City that I had heard about. Uh, just how the family relationships are, I don't know. But that branch, of course, came off his father's side. It must have been fair. Mm -hmm. Fair-haired and mm -hmm. fair-skinned. My father himself was fair-haired, mm -hmm. uh, very, uh, very light-complexioned, and uh, I always said he looked like a Baltic sea captain to me, <laughs> you know, or a Dutch uh, sailor. But I, I mean, that was that was the physio physiological mm -hmm. there aspect. Been any Sephardic uh, branches in the family? Well, well, that could explain the. Oh, yeah. Uh, the uh, family has been traced on my father's side, and I can't tell you who did this, back to 1492, the, the uh, expulsion from Spain. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the normal movement of Jews that were expelled from Spain, again, I, I can't give you... Uh, actual family connections, because I don't have them, there, there may be some extant information, uh, was that uh, most of them migrated out of Spain, when they went out of Spain, either to Italy or up through Holland, mm -hmm. and then moved up through Austria, uh, Poland, and Lithuania. Of course, Lith the Duchy of Lithuania was an independent mm -hmm state at that time, and from what history I have read, of course, the Jews were invited into Poland. They must have been invited. I mean, they never went to any place which originally was inhospitable. Mm -hmm. I mean, no place was really hospitable for, hospitable for them. But at that time, and I have never done the history of that era, mm -hmm. but an awful lot of Jews got into to that er uh, area. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, many of them were caught, you know, with the uh, partition of Poland, with the uh, mm -hmm the end of the um, Napoleonic Wars and all that, mm -hmm. uh, they seem to have been uh, spread pretty mm -hmm. pretty evenly through uh, Central Europe and mm -hmm. there, or yeah, Eastern Europe. And what about your uh, grandfather's father? That's the last one we'll talk about. Do you know anything about Can't him? give you a thing there. I just have no information. Anything from your mother's side? Well, my mother's family... Uh, her father was a rabbi, David Winnick, W-I-N-I-C-K. Uh, her mother, my mother, my grandmother, died in childbirth in her early 30s. There were three children of the marriage of my grandmother and grandfather. The eldest was a girl who died in about... Twelve or thirteen died of uh, uh, tuberculosis. Apparently, uh, I used to hear that it was um, that it was pneumonia, and it may have been pneumonia arising out yeah. of TB. Uh, of course, that was a period when there was no no cure. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what to do about uh, TB. Uh, my mother was the next oldest, and then she had a younger brother named Bill. Apparently, their father, uh, after the death of his wife, uh, went to South Africa during the gold rush. Mm -hmm. uh, when was that, about 1900? Yes. When, when uh, was gold hit in South Africa? In the 1890s, right? 1890s, well, 
uh, and my mother, and, and uh, he fades out. He must have died young. Or say before 40 or around the age of 40. I have heard somewhere in, that he had remarried, but of course that took him out of the pale of, uh, of uh, well, I don't know. There was something must have gone on because uh, he was not buried in consecrated ground mm -hmm. in the Jewish cemetery where his first wife was buried, my grandmother. And uh, there was obviously some breach of orthodox law involved, and I have never gotten that straight, and I don't know if my mother ever got it straight or if we could ever get it straight. However, my father had told me that when he was introduced to my mother and married her in 1915 through relatives in Danville, Illinois, by the way, uh, that because in families were very important to these people at that time. They ought to be important now. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. they're not. That uh, members of his family had told him that, oh yes, David Winnick, the rabbi, mm -hmm. was so well known and so learned and so famous in the little area of Lithuania that he came from that he had been chosen by the Jews in that area to represent them uh, directly at the Tsar's court. So he must have been somebody of some uh, academic or, liter lit uh, or um, intellectual stature mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Man, he obviously was young. Of course, they died young in those yes, days, too. Did. So uh, he could have been 30 years old and been a, an important uh, representative. Sure. But that's, see, these are all hearsay kind of, uh, of stories that I, I have never uh, been able to verify, and I don't know that there is any documentary evidence. My mother and my uncle were both, of course, brought up by relatives in the Boston area, mm -hmm. and uh, they were brought up as orphans, mm -hmm. simply, mm -hmm. simply it. Okay, let's go back to mm -hmm. uh, your father. Mm -hmm. uh, why did he leave Lithuania? Well, probably... Uh, to avoid uh, service in the Russian army mm -hmm. during the, the Russo-Japanese War. Okay, in uh, 1905. Then. What time? What year did he come in? Well, you know, I'd have to look at his uh, immigration papers, but I think he came in about. I got the impression about 1903. Mm -hmm. uh, well, his naturalization was in 1912. I, I I could check it yeah. out. I have his papers. Well, that's that's that came. that gives an that gives us about the approximate time. Yeah. Did he have any skills when he came? Well, he was uh, he was fairly well educated for a uh, young Jewish boy at the time from that area. He had been sent to a uh, school. Uh, I don't remember if they would have called it a Hochschule uh, or a, a Realschule mm -hmm. in Libau, which was in, in Estonia, the mm -hmm. port of Libau. Mm -hmm. And that uh, I got from him was a sort of uh, uh, special deal so that his family must have had some influence or money. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently there was a payoff to get Jewish boys into any kind of school any kind of a secular school is what I'm because at that time most of their schooling would have been strictly uh, uh, religious mm -hmm. in a uh, you know this would be kind of a classical school yeah. yeah and he had I remember up in I remember as a kid he had in a trunk upstairs when we lived on Charles Street his uniform that he wore school at the sc uniform. school uniform and uh, I remember it was a high button kind of a tunic, mm -hmm. sort of like you'd see Stalin wearing, yes. you know, sort of a dress, yeah. uh, school uniform. Like a Navy uh, summer dress. Yeah, it would have yeah. been something like yeah. that, you know, yeah. sort of a side uh, button and then yeah. uh, around the yeah. uh, neck. Mm -hmm. well, did, what languages did he speak? Oh, he, he, was, uh, he was quite literate. He spoke, of course, uh, he spoke Russian. Mm -hmm. The the uh, language, uh, the vernacular they all spoke was Yiddish. Mm -hmm. He was very good in Hebrew, and he was pretty good in German. Mm -hmm. Those are the languages that, of course,
course, there was a lot of German influence sure. in the east, uh, in the in that eastern uh, section of, along the Baltic. There. Mm -hmm. Did he have any English before he got there? I don't know. I don't know. But his English, uh, when he when I knew him, was was excellent. He was an avid reader, and uh, he was uh, just a great talker. His skills uh, were primarily a, a sharp mind, a good wit, and a fine personality. So he came over here and began selling for his brother Morris, who at that time had a glass plant in Matthews, Indiana, making glass chimneys. Okay, did he go directly to Matthews? As far as I know. Uh -huh. Do you know whether or not there was any organization that helped him when he got to no, because you see, he had these two well-established brothers. So he didn't have to have an I, immigrant aid. I don't think he had any. No, mm -hmm. no. They, um, he, he was something of a dandy. Mm -hmm. uh, he was all his life. Mm -hmm. Quite a dresser, and uh, um, I think he was in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Now he never mentioned any uh, immigrant aid because he knew right where he was going. Mm -hmm. So he come directly off Ellis Island and then goes. Well, I don't even know if he went to. He never mentioned that he went there, but he came directly. Castle to these, Gardens. Or, well, I, he yeah. never mentioned those, yeah. but uh, he um, he came directly to Muncie, mm -hmm. I guess. Or mm -hmm. sure, that would have been the train route. Okay. And now, uh, when did he meet your mother? Well, in 1915, he, in Danville, Illinois, mm -hmm. he was. By that time, he was a traveling salesman for a paper company in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Well, uh, with, a, with the coming of electricity, mm -hmm. this is what I'm mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, yeah. uh, gas mantles mm -hmm. and the glass chimneys, uh, those kind of lamps were, you know, immediately died out. Mm -hmm. So um, he, uh, and then the glass plant folded mm -hmm. in, in uh, Matthews, and then my uncle, the uncle that had that came to Muncie and opened up a clothing store. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father had to find work elsewhere, and he uh, found a job with the old Rothschild Brothers Paper Company in Fort Wayne. This isn't the Rothschild? No, no. It, uh, it isn't the famous Rothschild family, but these Rothschilds were Joe and Otto Rothschild, two bachelor brothers uh, who happened to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. I remember them very vaguely as a little boy up there. Mm -hmm. um, apparently were quite well to do and uh, owned uh, a lot of stock in the original, uh, I believe they owned a lot of stock in the original General Telephone Company mm -hmm. up there that was just getting underway. And uh, they ran this wholesale paper company in Fort Wayne, which was subsequently bought out by the competitive company, Fisher Brothers mm -hmm. Paper Company, which is still there. Mm -hmm. And that's where my father got in. He was a salesman on the road. He was peddling paper. But he lived in, in Muncie when he was working in Matthews. Well, right? no, he lived in Matthews he lived when in he Matthews. worked there. Yes. And apparently then, uh, I don't know exactly the chronology, when the glass plant folded, mm -hmm. he either came to Muncie or went up, he was unmarried, and mm -hmm. went to Fort Wayne where he had to find a job. Okay. Let, let me quickly mm -hmm. ask about the uncle who came to Muncie to open a clothing store. Uh, he came after the glass plant closed. Closed. What was the name of the store? Oh, it was a famous one where Stex was uh, for many years on Walnut Street there uh -huh. between uh, Adams and uh, Jackson on the east side of the street. And uh, it was called Moxie's. They, his nickname, my uncle. After my the uncle's nickname, soft drink? Moxie? After the soft drink, Moxie, and he was, uh, in those days, somebody who had a lot of Moxie, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, was sure. a, a man of, uh, of mm -hmm. uh, talent. He was a great gambler. Mm -hmm. He's another, he's, a, he's the colorful mm -hmm. brother. Mm -hmm. uh, he, um, he was a great card mm -hmm. player, and uh, I've heard that uh, he, uh, well, that's another story we're getting off, yeah. but he was with the famous Tex Rickard, if you remember the Promoter, sure. promoter, the Dempsey up, promoter, Dempsey yeah. promoter, yeah. fight promoter. He went up to uh, was in the Yukon in the gold rush up there with Rickard, mm -hmm. and uh, if there was anything that had to do with gambling, he was in on it. He was a, a natural. This was before he got the glass factory. This was apparently before the glass factory and before all his. Uh, but he was uh, he was a swinger, as we call. <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever ever became of him? 
Well, he lived in Muncie. Well, I remember while he was while I was a little boy, and uh, one day, well, of course, this was in the beginning of the Depression. He uh, he got in a little gambling problem with the Old Elks, as I remember, and he couldn't pay off, and uh, he had to leave town. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's the uh, the whispered story. Mm -hmm. Of course, being a little kid, I never was permitted to get <laughs> no, the, the so. facts. Uh, but uh, I know it was a very traumatic experience for my father because he was very fond of his older brother, and uh, they were they were soulmates in many ways. My father was never that kind of a of a gambler or swinger, but he he knew his way around. Well, whatever became of well, then he moved to Moxie or Morris moved to uh, New York opened up a dry cleaning establishment, and uh, he had a son and a daughter, and um, his son developed a process for uh, uh, redoing uh, suede leather, and then he was killed right before World War II in an automobile accident. This is your, uh, your He cousin. would have been a cousin of mine, yeah. Jimmy Schwartz, as mm -hmm. he was known here. They were always Schwartzes. Mm -hmm. uh, but they changed their names, by the way, back to Charney when they went to New York. Mm -hmm. They, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, but you see, by that time, by the 1930s, Charney sounded infinitely more elegant than Schwartz did, mm -hmm. which is kind of an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Yes. Um, <laughs> shows their styles and names, too. He has a daughter, Marjorie, who's still there, and her husband have been running the business ever since, and it is now, it has for years been called Leather Craft process of America, leather craft process, and they they do suede cleaning and dyeing and do it for all over the world. They've been uh, quite successful in their standing. Do you ever see them? Oh, yeah, yeah, I see them. Mm -hmm. I see them occasionally. In fact, I just got a, a note uh, from uh, Marjorie's husband yesterday sending me a clipping from the New York Times on your Kaplow oh, yeah. study of uh, Muncie. Is this the article by well, I don't know. I'll go see it. Okay. It's, it uh, I haven't read it yet. It's on my desk. Now, one other question. Yeah. Did Moxie's clothing store then become Stex? Did he sell it? Oh, no, no, no. He sold it up to a guy named uh, Bud, uh, I think it was Bud Smith, who'd worked for him for years. And Bud called it Bud's Duds. Bud's Duds. I remember that. This this would be when? Oh, probably. this was in the early 30s. This is in, the Depression. In the early 30s. Yeah, this is depression mm -hmm. time. And then after Bud couldn't make it, he was in for a few years. And then, uh, I don't remember the chronology, but Herschel Steck mm -hmm. took over the storeroom. It had nothing to do with the old business that was mm -hmm. all defunct. And Herschel had quite a following, and he opened up Steck's mm -hmm. in that location. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you're talking about the middle brother. The oldest brother, Sam, mm -hmm. had the economy shoe store. Many, many years, and lots of old-timers. Now, what, where is that located? Well, that, that is the store where uh, Milton Burgers really, yeah. really is, down on, uh, on North Walnut, right across from the courthouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in sort of in the middle of the block then. Of course, that whole block's been mm -hmm. moved around with the American National Bank and the other stores there. Mm -hmm. How do you account for the... Uh, Jewish interest in clothing. Is this, uh, is this, is this anything connected with the uh, uh, past history? You know, clothing stores in general have high inventory costs, right? And uh, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not a business that you get into without any capital. You need a little bit of capital in order to... Well, I, you know, uh, Dwight, I'm not, I really never thought too much about it, but my, uh, my quick response would be, a lot of these Jews that came through this part of the country came as peddlers, mm -hmm. and they came either with a pack on their back, or they came when they became more affluent, a horse and a on a wagon, mm -hmm. and then uh, eventually they began they began to be uh, salesmen and things like that. But they'd have to carry things that were uh, easily transportable that uh, wouldn't need a lot of uh, particular special care, 
And I assume that that would be kind of a logical thing. I don't know. Of course, Jews in the uh, in, in uh, Eastern Europe were uh, uh, in all kinds of trades. They were tailors. They were uh, shoe repair people. They were they were every they were small artisans and craftsmen because they couldn't own land. They couldn't farm. They couldn't own property as such. So they were pretty well restricted to the kinds of, of trades that were open to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't done enough on that immigrant history mm -hmm. to, uh, to mm -hmm. think about, but you've asked me. Now, I know that a lot of the well-known department stores in this country uh, started from Jewish peddlers, well, Goldwaters and, right. uh, and uh, Phoenix. Uh, right here, around here, I think of Weilers at Portland, Indiana, mm -hmm. and uh, now it's Weilers and Anderson. It's the grandson of young Ray, but I remember the old man up there. He was tremendously wealthy in the 1920s. He was riding around in a chauffeured mm -hmm. uh, car. Mm -hmm. uh, it was old Weiler Brothers, mm -hmm. uh, but they had come from Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of these people who may have started out and got a little bit of money, went to a lot of these small towns in the Middle West and opened up. I think that was probably the easiest thing for them to do, to open up uh, clothing stores and then branch out into other departments. Mm -hmm. And they might they might have some connection with people who were manufacturing or, or have some well, I've, knowledge of that. I've heard of that and that there were a lot of these so-called manufacturers, of course, that might have lent them or right. given them credit yeah. for a year or two to get on their feet. Right. You know, it was kind of a... A round robin arrangement, right? Maybe. But I'm again. This is all hearsay. Okay. This is not good, good okay. solid history. Okay, let's go back to your childhood in Fort Wayne. You're yeah. born in Fort Wayne, yeah. and uh, how long did you live in Fort Wayne? Well, you see, my father was <clears throat> my father was married. Father and mother were married in 1915 in Chicago. He came. They came back to Fort Wayne, where he had a job as a salesman. Mm -hmm. I remember my mother telling me he made all of thirty dollars a month. Mm -hmm got married on that, and did all his traveling on that. In those days, he traveled. His territory was determined by where, where the railroads and the interurbans out of Fort Wayne went. Mm -hmm. So he would always, he had long trips, I remember as a kid, which he continued after we started in business here, always on the uh, old nickel plate as far east as Cleveland, Ohio. And then he would work that whole Ohio territory, which he used to call his golden territory. That's where he established himself best. Um, I was born in 1917, and they moved to Muncie when I was three years old. They must have moved to Muncie in 1920. Mm -hmm. Now, that was after World War I. Mm -hmm. My father told me that uh, he was, I've, I've often asked him about why Muncie, why did he want to go in for so he said he had concepts <coughs> of the kind of business that he wanted to run, and that would be where he would tell his customers what they were going to get, and they would get what he sold them. Mm -hmm. And he said when he worked for the Rothschild brothers, he never knew what they were going to ship. Mm -hmm. He was a, a typical salesperson. I say typical in the sense that I've seen so many in the in the in years since then, who felt that he could do a better job than the boss than the boss to it. Now, what was he selling? Well, what was he, he was selling? He was selling uh, all kinds of things: toilet paper, paper towels. Uh, his customers were primarily uh, uh, grocery stores. Uh, and there were some big ones in those days. He sold washboards, mm -hmm. clotheslines, clothespins, mm -hmm. jar rings. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to remember in all these things. In addition to the paper. Yeah, but you see, we call ourselves paper people, but there have always been a lot of things that had nothing to do with paper. All right. Okay. Now, what do you remember of uh, early life in Muncie? Well, I remember a great deal. Uh, I remember, of course, the big event in all our lives, and 
me at three years old was the starting of the Schwartz Paper Company in December of, of I believe, December of 20 or the beginning of 1921 when uh, the business was uh, begun on South Walnut Street in a building that my mother and father paid $12,500 for. It's still standing. We still use it. You still own it? We still own it. Uh, they bought it from the Miller Brewing Company of Milwaukee because that was right after Prohibition. And all of these um, breweries around the country uh, owned their real estate, you know, mm -hmm. that was there. They had captive yeah. outlets. And I don't know how they made the connection, but uh, they bought it from the Miller Brewing Company, and we've owned it since, in the family, since 1921. Where's that located exactly? Well, it's between the two railroads, right there on the east side of the street in South Wall, where you cross the railroad. It's a two-story uh, brick building, about 60-foot frontage. Are there some businesses in it now? No, no. We use it as a warehouse. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. It's been fixed up, new front. But it, for many years after we moved out uh, of the building and moved to other places, it uh, was a tavern again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I remember that. Then there is fairly close to Merle, and to what was Merle? Yeah, well, Civil Aid. it it would be across the, on the other side of the street, but yeah. down, but it would be further north than mm -hmm. Muncie. Okay, how many uh, Jewish families were in Muncie when you moved in? You wouldn't have known that right at the start. Oh, I wouldn't have known it, but I would say that it was a pretty active Jewish community in those days. Uh, I can't give you counts, but the, our our temple was uh, dedicated in 1922, and uh, I went to kindergarten and went through the first six grades to the old Jefferson School. And believe it or not, I remember that building when it was going up. I remember it in, in framing, mm -hmm. you know, when it was just a frame structure that was uh, being erected. Mm -hmm. And then I remember the dedication of that building. Uh, so that was in 1922 or 23. Now the Jefferson School was down on... Uh, Jefferson School was on Jackson. Right. Uh, between, what was it, Garkey and... Uh, I can't remember those cross streets. Mm -hmm. But it was about... Uh, it was uh, just one block. Uh, would be west mm -hmm. on Jackson Street, on the same side of the street as the temple is now. Where, where were you living? At that, well, we first lived on West Howard Street in the mm -hmm. 400 block of West Howard Street mm -hmm. in an old double house, which is still there, mm -hmm. that was owned by, at that time, Judge uh, Lon Guthrie mm -hmm. of Muncie, the famous, Muncie the, name. the famous Muncie name. And he had uh, also been mayor of Muncie, I understand, before that, before he became yes, circuit right. court judge. Right. He was the landlord. And then in about 1924 or 25, we moved to a much higher class place, which was on 509 West Charles Street. That was literally around the corner, but it was a much nicer street. Mm -hmm. And I suppose we were moving onward and upward although economically, although I didn't recognize it. We also, I remember, I remember the first Model T Ford that the family bought. Mm -hmm. And then from that, we moved up to a used Packard. And from that, the first big new car we got was a 1929 Studebaker Commander 6. Mm -hmm. And that was a real dream That's boat. That's an impressive car. That was an impressive car. If I had it now, I'd be worth a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what about uh, the other Jewish families? And did they live near the synagogue? Yeah, uh, now, I the would say. The synagogue was, was at the start of Reform Synagogue. Right? It has been uh, the congregation in Muncie from its inception in about what 1875 or 80 has always been affiliated with the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. That's the Reform mm -hmm. branch, and so, this was the period of which we call period of classic reform. Mm -hmm. uh, most, uh, most of the Jews in Muncie attended that temple, as we always called it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were always a few 
uh, unrelenting orthodox that would never step foot into it. Mm -hmm. This this means then that uh, the other Jewish families wouldn't have to live in the area of the synagogue. They don't. I mean, they there's not the prohibition against driving to the synagogue or anything like that. that oh no, not or not in reform. No. However, the the interesting thing is that I as I look back in the 1920s, most of the Jews in Muncie lived in the within uh, a few block area of synagogue. And of course, don't forget, when that was constructed and conceived, the automobile wasn't nearly no. the, uh, uh, the important. That thing was conceived of, obviously, before World War I right. had been thought about. And when it was actually got underway, it was after World War I, and uh, it met the needs of most of the people. There were a few lived out in the so-called Riverside area, but that was not, a, not very many. And they'd still be relying on public transit primarily. Yeah, but automobiles you see in the 20s came in very rapidly. Mm -hmm. There were even some older families that lived out on the south side of the town in the old Kirby Avenue area, which was very nice in those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember there was a, uh, a family, I believe it was Philip Levy, See, there are a lot of old people that are gone. Nobody remembers them, and I just have vague recollections of them. Their names in the temple, and, mm -hmm. and on who were members of various things. Mm -hmm. And I remember they lived in that part of town, but it was very nice. The older part of town, the the eastern. See, Muncie began in the in the eastern part of town, and mm -hmm. my uncle Sam lived out on East Jackson Street, which was a very very nice prestigious address. Uh, yeah, area in those days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, only the newcomers uh, later in the uh, 1900s, in the, say the era around World War I and into the 20s, began to live in a westerly part. Right. When, when did your family move across the river? 1929. Mm -hmm. That early. That's pretty early. Yeah. Well, there were several, a lot of them uh -huh. there by that time. And where did, where did you move? Well, we, we, my father bought the house at... Uh, 1022 West North Street, North, where your mother lives. Where my Street. mother is today, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I remember that was a that was a great move. And then I went to Emerson School from Jefferson. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I didn't put that much stock into it at the time, but I mm -hmm. I, I realized that was a major migration. Mm -hmm. When you first came to Muncie, what were the occupations of most of the Jewish people in Muncie? Clothing business. Yeah, as according to my recollection, yes, I would say most of them. There were one or two. There was one, a Louis Shapiro from Chicago, who had a, a clothing manufacturing company. Uh, he called the Victor Garment Company, mm -hmm. and it was upstairs on the corner of Howard and Walnut, where Ball Stores owns this mm -hmm. store now. It was a second-floor operation. Why he came to Muncie, maybe because of cheap labor, or mm -hmm. I didn't know that we had any great skills for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there may have been, I don't remember any other Jews at that time that were in anything other than either the scrap business, there were some, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there were some people in the scrap business, and then uh, my father started the wholesale paper business, which was mm -hmm. a little odd. Mm -hmm for the uh, general run. Typically then it would be clothing and scrap. Be the well, I, I would say the merchants, as I think of them, on Walnut Street were mostly clothing. Mm -hmm. Clothing and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Did these occupations change over time? That is, what happened to these people? Did they continue in the clothing business somewhere else, or did they shift into something, some other kind of occupation? I wouldn't say that there were so many shifts that I know of. They got older and they died out, and their stores were either sold or went out of business. Mm -hmm. Or the people, if they made it well enough economically, they simply moved away to more uh, comfortable uh, climates. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the next question. Why did they move? Is it because of climate or making money? Is there any kind of event connected with it? Did this happen in the Depression or 
prior well, I think a lot of them went out of business. Yeah. A lot, there was a lot of a lot of problems that I yeah. remember, a lot of economic yeah. problems. Yeah. I know that that uh, we had a great struggle, uh, my yeah. family. Uh, it's interesting, though, that from the beginning, uh, we had the aura of having money. Mm-hmm. I've never quite understood how that... Was your father changed. successful from the start? Well, he, you know, he started with, uh, I think, all of uh, a total uh, amount of money of maybe a capital of about $4,000, most of which my mother had saved mm-hmm. because she never spent any money. And uh, that was... She was the was the real money uh, grubber in the family. Had she worked? And no, had, but she worked in the business with him. Oh, she, she had worked as a young girl. So she how, had worked how, all her life. How'd she save the money? Just from household budget? Household or? budget. She used to pay herself for doing her own laundry. And she'd pay herself <laughs> for doing every task that she did. Right. And uh, if she had 10 cents, she'd save a nickel of it. Mm-hmm. She was an extremely frugal person who never had anything. She was... Uh, and poverty uh, was always part of her life. Mm-hmm. And she told me in later years, she told me right here in this office one day, she said, you know, you and I have had different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. She said, uh, uh, I understand that money will never mean to you what it has meant to me because you were never in the kinds of positions that I was in. Mm-hmm. Now, I understand what she was saying, but uh, became... She was not a, um, she never hung on to money because of love of money itself, but it meant security to her Mm -hmm. that she had never had as a child. She grew up, she never had, she's often told me that how she cried when she got out of the sixth grade because she realized that her aunts and cousins really were not going to let her go to school anymore. Mm -hmm. She had to go to work. Mm -hmm. And that was always her great deprivation. I think that one of the great reasons that she wanted to see me well educated in a prestigious place was to meet her needs as mm-hmm. much as, That's and that was very, it was uh, very important to her. Mm-hmm. And of course, I, I did take to it. I don't know why, but mm-hmm. whatever those values were, I, I caught them. Mm-hmm. Did any of the people who left leave because of wanting to go to another? Jewish community? Is, is that a factor, or is it primarily economic? Well, Dwight, you know, who is to say what the real motivations were? A lot of them failed here economically. So it's primarily economic. Well, that's a hell of a generalization yeah. for me to make. How do I know? Yeah. Many of them may have been very lonely here. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of them, of course, being a Jew in Muncie, Indiana, you're, uh, you're, uh, uh, you can't be anonymous. No, that's for sure. And uh, I think a lot of them were uncomfortable in the uh, sort of uh, showcase, if you want to call it, of a Muncie, Indiana, as Jews. Mm-hmm. What about those who were Orthodox? You mentioned there were a couple. Would they, would they have felt that? Uh, they would have found Muncie completely untenable if their orthodoxy. For example, the business of keeping kosher was yeah. always very difficult. Couldn't do it if you didn't have a butcher. Uh, well, then you'd have to go to Indianapolis. Yeah. A lot of people would have stuff sent in from Indianapolis on the interurban, I remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to keep strictly kosher and to live an orthodox Jewish life was pretty difficult, almost, almost impossible. You had to have enormous... Uh, determination mm-hmm. and uh, it had to be terribly important to you. Mm-hmm. That would have been difficult. Mm-hmm. What was the social life that uh, in uh, the Jews in Muncie as you grew up as a child? Did, you, did your parents have much of a social life or was it mostly business? Well, they didn't know. They didn't have a great deal of social life. Uh, both of them were in the business. Mm-hmm. Both of them were enormously uh, concerned with getting ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother uh, worked from the day that the company opened. She was inside from the first day it opened. And my father was outside. He was a seller. Mm-hmm. He was selling. He was the personality. And he was the, um, mm-hmm. uh, he was the guy who made it go. But she was the one who sat on the, on the purse. 
and kept the books and kept the books and did all that. So they wouldn't have much much social life. Would would there ever be anybody in for dinner other than Robert? He could spot these uh, uh, so-called rabbis and uh, people who were asking for money for various institutions because he was a good Hebrew scholar and when they would come in and start talking to him in Yiddish, you know, he could go either way in two different languages and he would immediately start to quiz them and, and he could trap them very quickly so he would always tell me this one is a phony and this one isn't, uh, you know. Let me ask you, go ahead. going back to your mother, would it be typical of other Jewish women that they would be working in the business or is this atypical? In Muncie, it was atypical. That's what I thought. She Absolutely would, not. She would she would not need the social contacts because she would have all this uh, uh, personal contact in the business. So in, in that sense, she's not like another perhaps Jewish wife who's home who doesn't have anything to do, doesn't see anybody. So and she, and every day she's working with people. So oh, she yeah. doesn't have the isolation yeah. that... Well, she sure wasn't isolated, but there was, of course, a lot of Jewish uh, social life... Uh, uh, revolving around what they called the club in those days, which was on the second floor of this a building on Main Street where K.J. Brown is now. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first services and the first religious school I ever went to in this town were in that, in, in, on that second floor. Mm -hmm. And the community kept that long after the temple was built, and that was primarily a place for uh, social gatherings, which involved poker, mahjong, or pinochle. Mm -hmm. Now, now this was where the services were held originally. Before the temple. Right. Yeah. Now, did you have any feeling when you were young of your social position in the community? Are there social divisions in the Jewish community that were noticeable so that you could say, well, I'm identified or my family's identified with a particular uh, social economic class? You said earlier that your father had the reputation of being uh, moderately wealthy. Even when he wasn't, yeah, and we didn't yeah. have any money really to last to the depression. Yeah, but you you did you did still have the the feeling that that your family was one of the yeah family. yeah, and I I don't know where that came from. I mean, there wasn't much economic basis yeah. for it, but I think a lot of them. That as I think back over who some of the people were, I don't think there was that much economic basis for yeah. any of them. I think yeah. this was a relative kind of a situation. Is there any sense that there are a group of poor Jewish persons? People who would be considered shiftless or uh, uh, or poverty stricken. I suppose several several categorizations. People who who didn't have money because they didn't work, or people who were who worked hard but couldn't make it because of of uh, circumstances. Do you have any sense that there are those kinds of divisions? As a youngster, I didn't. Looking back at it, I think the real divisions that I remembered particularly during the 30s, the Depression, when I became more aware of these social and economic distinctions, were the problem of older people in the community who had uh, some position at one time but were no longer able to work and apparently had very meager, uh, very, very meager incomes. And mm -hmm. I think uh, there was a great, I remember a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And I could almost name names of people who, uh, who were in really desperate economic situation, but who had a great pride mm -hmm. and attempted to maintain their uh, dignity and their status mm -hmm. uh, in, those, uh, in those situations. Mm -hmm. But uh, nobody considered them pariahs particularly, and I don't remember anybody who was considered shiftless, mm -hmm. shiftless and unwilling. Mm -hmm. the, the real sharp distinction, the problems that I remember were the older, elderly, the mm -hmm. elderly people who were over there real productive days and really didn't have anything laid aside. There wouldn't be anybody then who couldn't participate in the social club because of the uh, ostracism in the community, because of the feeling that they might not be, meet the standards of the local community. Well, you see, I wasn't part of that, and mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, I really wouldn't know. There may have been, of course, those feelings uh, always yeah. go through a group, but I, mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of them. Okay, I want to ask a couple more questions mm -hmm. on, on uh, this theme, and then I want to get back to the mm -hmm. earlier one. Were Jews involved in community life? That is, 
uh, to what extent did they participate in uh, political activities? Were there any Jews who held important city or state positions, either in political organizations or economic organizations, and so on? Were they, were they important outside the Jewish community? Again, in retrospect, I did not realize how much the Jewish community was isolated in the, in the 20s and 30s from the mainstream of the establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, uh, Jews had been much more active in, at the turn of the century than they subsequently began to be, particularly after World War I. World War I apparently <coughs> unleashed all kinds of prejudices yes, I think you're in right. this country <coughs> that hadn't been overly, hadn't been so overt beforehand. Uh, Jews had been members of uh, the Elks. Mm -hmm. My father was an Elk. I mean, had been members of the Masonic Orders and everything mm -hmm. back around the uh, 1910 area, uh, 1900 to 1910. Uh, then their restrictions began to come in and uh, there were it became very difficult if not impossible during those periods for Jews to enter mm -hmm. into some of these things there was never a Jew a member of a, a service club in Muncie mm -hmm. unfortunately until the 1950s mm -hmm. uh, who was that uh, me that's what I thought <laughs> well wait a minute I said 50s uh, what am I talking about it was in the middle 60s before and I mean, I this would be the Kiwanis Rotary. Yeah, well, this was uh, I was in both. I was in Kiwanis first, and then I was asked afterward to go into. And I frankly was not interested in what went on there, mm -hmm. and I dropped out. And then later, I was asked to go into Rotary, and I decided that I would, although I had no illusions at that mm -hmm. time. But it was it was a period of great breaking down of things. Of course, I'd gone into the Masonic Order after World War II. I didn't have too much trouble with that, but I think I was the first Jew who'd gone in in about 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, came the uh, Delaware Country Club, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was not the first, I was about the second or third. Mm -hmm. uh, then came, of course, Muncie Club, you know, mm -hmm. they never had any Jewish mm -hmm. members, I was the first one there. Uh, all of these things I've kind of taken tongue in cheek, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like, uh, well, now they got their house Jew. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Uh, but uh, of course, it's never been any problem. But uh, the, a lot of these prejudices were were established by a group of the 1920s and 30s establishment in Muncie, and uh, they were never quite sure why they were prejudiced. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, this was common with a lot of things going on in this country. Now, to ask, answer your other question about any Jew being in any position, the only one that I can think of politically was Charles Indorf, mm -hmm. who was the uh, street commissioner or commissioner of public works under the George Dale administration. Mm -hmm. And Charlie was absolutely uh, untouchable, I mean, uh, morally or, you know, nobody could, he, he just wasn't. Mm -hmm. He was too straight to ever uh, take a nickel, and he was known that way in this community. He was an immigrant, mm -hmm. spoke with an accent, and I remember he used to walk around the sidewalks and tell people to put salt where the, where the uh, grass was growing in the cracks of the cement because there wasn't any money to do anything. But he, he took it seriously. Now, Dale had come in on a reform platform. Absolutely. And, and part of his argument was that the administration which had preceded him, which was... Uh, I think Hampton's administration. No, 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 no. Hampton came after. Uh, oh no, wait. Hampton was mayor twice, wasn't he? Yes. Uh -huh. He could have been. John could have been mayor before George. But uh, I'm trying to remember who was. Wouldn't, well, wouldn't have been Doc Bunch. Of course, Doc was a rep was a Democrat too. No, Doc was in trouble in those yeah. days. He didn't get out of trouble till after George Dale. Yeah, I think I think maybe it was Hampton. It may have been the first Hampton administration. Right. Yeah. But in any case, the, there had been a lot of scandal with that, particularly oh, yeah. in the streets. And mm -hmm. so yeah. this person then came in with a reputation as Dale had of being... Oh, he was really Mr. Clean. There wasn't yeah. any question about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
no, he's the only Jew that I can remember that had any political, and he was not a had got political clout. He was a civil servant right. in the best sense of the word. Now, what did he do for a living? Uh, he was in the clothing business. He had um, what was the name of it? No, he was originally he had a pawn shop on South Walnut Street, and a fellow named Bill or named Elliot worked for him for years and finally took it over. Mm -hmm. and, it, and in pawn shops you sold leather goods and mm -hmm. other all kinds of in, other things. And then he went in the clothing business after he sold out his pawn shop. Mm -hmm. And that became, I believe, King's. There was King's clothing shop on the corner where Paisal Jewelry is today. And that was there for years. And then there was a fellow named Herman Haas that came in, yes. And then Charlie Indorf's wife had uh, a couple of nephews named Stanley and Leonard Schuster. They were her sister's children, and they came up and took over the, the Kings. And then uh, he made then Stanley made it into uh, well, another clothing store years later. He used to use the Esquire motif in front of it. It's on South Walnut Street. It, Finally closed up two or three years ago. Stanley passed away about. He had left Muncie, gone to Florida after his wife died, mm -hmm. and I think Leonard's still alive down there. Okay, now he's identified as a Democrat. Is there any kind of visible political identification of with the Democratic or the Republican Party in the twentieth, nineteen twenties? I wouldn't have remembered any. So, so you get the feeling then that political you, consciousness came with FDR right. and the New Deal. People aren't really discussing politics. No, involved one no, way or the other. No, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a kid then. Mm -hmm. Is there any involvement? Your father was an elk. Is there any involvement with any significant business organizations, chamber of commerce, or, or any any kind of retail clothing organizations? Or when did your father, for example, join the paper organization? Member of. Do you have any idea of that? That, yeah, because I was with him <laughs> about in 1932 or 33. Mm -hmm. So that comes later, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, in other words, you get the sense in the 1920s that, that people in the Jewish community, if they're businessmen, they're individual entrepreneurs, they aren't connected with trade associations, they, they don't have a political connection. Right? No, I didn't get any sense of that. No, no they were all. And of course, during the 20s, you had the problem of the Klan, and Jewish business people particularly uh, uh, tried to keep, I'd say, a low profile on the grounds that most of their customers were Klansmen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Okay, let me go, let me go back to uh, one or two other quick things, because time is about up, yeah. that, I, that I, I thought of that I want to add to this. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this, when you were going to Emerson, of course, this is a just an elementary school, it's like any other elementary school. First thing, what is the arrangement? Your mother is working. Do you, do you go to work in a paper plant? Do you come home? Does somebody take care of you? Do you have any, how's that Well, arrangement? of course, by the time I got in Emerson, I was to have been about, uh, it was 1929, 30. I was uh, junior high school in Emerson. Mm -hmm. In the earlier days of Jefferson, I remember that my mother always had somebody, usually a colored woman. Mm -hmm that she paid between five and seven dollars a week for mm -hmm. to stay at home. Mm -hmm. And I used to go down to the place on South Walnut Street after school was out mm -hmm. quite often in the afternoons and play there. That was mm -hmm. my, that was kind of where I went. Go down to the plant. To the plant and if the woman went home, there was always somebody around me, mm -hmm. I remember. But uh, I was, uh, it was all, the house and the, and the business were all in walking distance, you see, in those days. And then when you went to high school, of course, you went well, to Central I, I and you were very close and you could go back and forth between the business. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that wasn't any particular problem. I don't even remember how I went to school. I must have ridden, even though I walked a lot, mm -hmm. which would have done me good now. And uh, then there was always somebody who had a car or rides. And, of course, I was very social in mm -hmm. high school and very active and all kinds of things. But you would be working down at the paper plant. Well, I never really worked like mm -hmm. hell. I mean, I was uh, I was the the young kid. Mm -hmm. I always had my things I to do, and I 
I played around there, mm -hmm. but actually, in actually saying doing jobs or anything, oh, occasionally it'd be little specific things, but I had no organized work mm -hmm. at the place. Okay, one uh, one last yeah. question for this tape. Was there any attempt to maintain a Hebrew school where you would learn Hebrew? Never that I can remember. There was there was no attempt for any other kind of education except the secular one. No, and then there was always some sort of religious school going on, but that, of course, never was terribly effective, either right. in my day and, or in my children's day. Did, did uh, your parents send you to this, this kind of religious? Education? Oh, well, I mean, whatever went on at the temple, we were there. Mm -hmm. Whatever was available, we, we took care of, we, we did. What would that typically be, a Sunday school? Or well, it would be a, a Sunday Sabbath, school. Sabbath school. Well, it would be on Sunday. Yeah. It always has been for years yeah. and years. But it would be... Uh, An hour or two on a Sunday morning. Yeah. But it was never a highly organized congregational effort because mm -hmm. there was no formal... Uh, we never had a permanent rabbi. Mm -hmm. Well, we did. We had intermittently. We had uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, resident rabbis, but that was the... Mm -hmm. Then if, the, uh, if a resident rabbi came, he would be the one who would conduct the... Uh, yeah, the religious school, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. But it was never a very well-organized kind of thing. It was intermittent. Mm -hmm. Did your father make any attempt to teach you Hebrew? Uh, very like interesting. I often asked him why uh, he didn't. And his attitude was, you know, what in the devil do you need this for in America? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what would you do with it? Now, he, of course, knew it well. Now, he did. Uh, he performed my bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm taught me everything, and of course I learned the Hebrew sections by rote. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was, mm -hmm. so so I had it in my ear, I've had it in my ear all these years, but uh, interestingly enough, because he was intellectually inclined, he, he was unable to see the relevance mm -hmm. of uh, learning Hebrew mm -hmm. uh, for a young boy in America, mm -hmm. and, and at that time, of course, I <coughs> often felt that that was a that was something I would have liked to have had, and I, uh, I uh, am working on it now, a little late in life, yeah. uh, simply because of my own interest. Mm -hmm. Remember the famous story about Justice Holmes? Who, uh, someone saw him when he was 90 years old, and he said he was reading French. And they said, yeah. why? And he said, to improve my mind. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> it. No, now you're on. See, that's the fast movement. I see. Yeah. Now you're uh, now you're on it. Okay. We're ready for question What was the relationship of the Jews and non Jews in our state? Richard Munson. Yeah, but that's not a very clear question. Okay, the next question is do you recall any specific anti Semitic incidents affecting you and your family? I guess what they're after is was there any overt or covert anti Semitism? I can't remember any specific incidents other than the usual school kid incidents of somebody calling you a, a Jew or, or uh, that uh, you rejected Jesus and mm -hmm. things like that. They were always, uh, there was always the usual kid you know, epithets thrown at each other. Uh, I uh, I remember that I was very, I used to play all the time with a young fellow named Bob Norcross, whose father was the big, one of the big wheels in the clan in Muncie, and uh, Sparky Walsh, who was a good Catholic, you know, and, mm -hmm. I, and Freddie McClellan, uh, there was a whole group of us, and we didn't we didn't make much distinction, but uh, we knew what the uh, uh, what was going on and what uh, things who was supposed to be uh, for and against various things. But it never was very serious to us as kids. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to talk about going down on East Washington Street in the big house that at that time was it was an old Kitzelman home, the one with the portico or the big pillars in front that then became the Fidelt house yeah. and yeah. 
and we used to go upstairs on the third floor and where they had all the clan sheets lined up and we used to dress up in those and play upstairs they, <laughs> all the kids yeah was that their headquarters it was at that time that'd be uh, in the 1920s oh yeah yeah it would be the uh, toward the end of the i the clan had had peaked out see in 24 and this yeah. may have been 28 yeah. 27 or 28 but they had all the spare sheets up there and everything. <laughs> Did you ever see any clan parade? Oh, God, yes. I remember those down on Walnut Street, yeah. many of them. Father always used to take me down there, and I'd sit on his shoulders because mm -hmm. I was, yeah. well, I was a little kid. And they they were more specifically anti-Catholic. or were, were, were Anti-Catholic, and an, yes, and anti-black. Yeah. There weren't enough Jews, you see, in my judgment, around yeah. Muncie to make much of a target. Mm -hmm. Most of the Jews were in the retail business on Walnut Street, but uh, most of them had very good relationships with uh, their uh, clientele. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think anybody particularly would want to, uh, at that time, had any great hostilities to them as business people. They may have uh, been very prejudiced, mm -hmm. probably were. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember some of those clan torchlight parades, uh, and of course I used to comment on this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea of Americanism was to have a big, fat gal seated on a, on a, a white draft horse with the American flag draft draped over its rump. You know, yeah. and uh, she's sitting on it, yeah. and that was uh, yeah. that was a hundred percent Americanism mm -hmm. of that day. Mm -hmm. It was a in retrospect, a, uh, I, did, I never felt that it was a threat or my yeah. parents because I don't think we'd have gone up. They yeah. would uh, uh, they would knock blacks off the street or, or push them aside, you know, because mm -hmm. they were always hooded. Nobody yeah. knew who was doing it. Yeah. But uh, I think it was ma mainly an anti-Catholic yeah. uh, and it secondarily an anti-black, and, and uh, it was... It didn't have really strong, mm -hmm. uh, in in this area that I remember, strong anti-Semitic overtones. Yeah. Now, would, would it have, uh, would the newspaper print pictures of the parades? Would they ever get inside and show who was a member of the Klan? Now, it was supposed to be secret. Was that? Was that? Oh, I well, now, don't forget, I was pretty young in those yeah. days, but uh, I did my research on it, you know, when I was in college. Yeah. Oh, no. No, it was a very hush-hush thing. It was. But oh, even, yeah. even so, you knew who some of the people who were in it. I mean, by word of mouth. Well, by word of mouth. But, of course, uh, George Dale, who was the great yeah. reformer here, used to point out that you ought to, you know, you got your bankers and everybody. Yeah. Uh, and now I remember that uh, when I was in high school and... Uh, Pete Jolly, who was the coach, yeah. the basketball coach, taught history. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Pete was a great guy, but he certainly didn't know much about history or teaching. <laughs> good and, basketball player. And, and uh, well, he was a good coach, but he would comment about the Klan. This was in the 30s now. Mm -hmm. And he said he was from Newcastle in those days. And he, Pete used to say, well, you know, everybody joined. All you needed was 10 or $15 for your sheet, and it was considered the thing to do. Now, who... Who paraded and who didn't parade and everything like that. Was he a member? Yeah, he said he'd joined. Yeah. He was just a youngster, he said, yeah. but uh, hell, they were out for the $10. <laughs> and he was laughing about it because yeah. he didn't consider it any, a matter of any particular significance, as I'm sure that that uh, many of the people who joined didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not the kind of racism uh, that I that I have read about in the South. It had, yeah. and most of the people, frankly, I used to have the impression were kind of dumb bunnies who didn't really know what yeah. what they were doing anyway. But it was a sort of camaraderie, and it was a dress up mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, the rank and file weren't playing for keeps. Mm -hmm. The uh, the officers and the management and there was big money in it yeah you got a commission uh, on uh, on every on membership and everything else there were a lot of them were really playing it mm -hmm. uh for keeps it was damn good business yeah well outside in the clan any other anything else that particularly uh well i remember as a kid 
my parents being horrified and talking a great deal about the Leopold Loeb case uh -huh. in Chicago mm -hmm. and about Clarence Darrow defending them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were very much concerned. In those days, the whole emphasis was that uh, we were our brother's keepers. Mm -hmm. And I know that, in, at least in our household, uh, that was a very mm -hmm. uh, serious concern because mm -hmm. the papers were full of it, and mm -hmm. it was a, uh, a heinous crime, and uh, no question about that. But they were primarily concerned because the all three, the victim and the two mm -hmm. perpetrators, were all Jews mm -hmm. from very prominent homes in Chicago. Did you notice any anything in the newspapers or any problem during the Depression? Hard time sometimes brings out feelings. Yeah, very interesting. I can't remember anything. In fact, we have talked about it mm -hmm. uh, since. I have no recollection. Of course, my my uh, awareness uh, mm -hmm. yeah. of things in my adulthood came during the Depression. Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember I remember the crash. I remember mm -hmm. the uh, whole business. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't remember any particular overtones except, uh, well, when the Nye Committee in the Senate was yeah. investigating the munitions makers, and then you'd hear things, vague things about international bankers and things, and there were always snide remarks, you know, mm -hmm. about the names, but, but that was never a very specific... That wouldn't uh, be local anyway. Uh, no, 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 not in terms of local. Uh -uh. No, I'm just thinking in terms... I can't honestly remember much. Well, now, when, when you were in high school, if mm -hmm. you were Jewish, could you get into the uh, clubs or on the Oh, yeah, team? yeah. Was there that, any problem with that? No, that was never a problem. In fact, I was, uh, uh, it was big business in those days, and I, uh, I was asked, and there were uh, boys' clubs and mm -hmm. girls' clubs, and mm -hmm. uh, that, was, that was the social, yeah. uh, that's, uh, that was the social high level. Yeah, and sewing club. The uh, sewing club and the violet club and the, for the girls and the, then there was the triangle club and the and uh, what the TBC the boys club and uh, there was one other boys but uh, that was uh, that was the top and I uh, I was asked in the triangle club very early mm -hmm. in the game uh, at the appropriate time. And uh, that was a big part of my high school life. And then I ended up my senior year, I was president, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was a big social deal. Well, that, was, uh, that was big yeah. apples. Yeah. Though that was never a problem with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, um, I suppose that all through high school and college and since, I have used my Jewish, uh, my Judaism, uh, not as a uh, halter, but as a point of departure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have always found, I found it particularly at Harvard, which was very traumatic for me at the first year, mm -hmm. that uh, because I was told when on the first day I got there by fellow who was Jewish, uh, all the things that I could or couldn't do because I was Jewish. Mm -hmm. And my first response was, well, I'm in the wrong place. I'd better go back to Muncie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that was, that was not thinkable because my parents would have, it would have crushed them. And, uh, this, this is the question, maybe yeah. it's tangential, yeah. how did you happen to get into Harvard? I mean, how did you happen to think about going? How did you happen to? Well, uh, never occurred to me till about my end of my junior year. My father had a stroke, mm -hmm. and uh, relatives of ours from Boston came out, uh, a father and a son, cousins, and uh, their mother. And uh, the father had gone to Harvard. He was a poor immigrant boy from Boston, and his son was already in Harvard about three years older than I am, and uh, they began talking it up and pointing out that, that coming from Muncie, Indiana, would be a very easy thing for me to get in, and uh, frankly, they were right. It never had uh, crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. In those days, Harvard had a, that was before World War II, had an admissions yeah. uh, program about, they would admit 
you if you were in the highest one-seventh of the boys in your graduating high school class. Mm -hmm. no, not highest one-seventh, and the class had to have at least seven boys <laughs> in it. So I don't know if you came from a little one-room schoolhouse with three boys if they'd have taken you in. But that's the only reason I got in. I couldn't have passed college boards in those mm -hmm. days. Well, what, you were in the top, that'd be the top 14%. You were, what was your standing in the class? Well, there were about 300, in my high school class, if I remember, there were about 350 or 360. And I was probably, oh, no better than the top 20 mm -hmm. in the top 20. Mm -hmm or top 30, but at least it, I was clearly in the top one-seventh of yeah. the boys, mm -hmm. and that was really all it took. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I had no difficulty with admissions mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Well, can you think of any other examples of, uh, or any other incidences of anti-Semitism? In the 20s. Or any time, any time, you or your family. Anything your father mentioned, anything that your children mentioned, anything that uh, happened to anybody remotely connected with you, I guess. Well, of course, the main the main problem with anti-Semitism in this town was uh, where you could live. Mm -hmm. That was the most overt mm -hmm. and clearly uh, uh, restrictive kind of policy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are very interested if you can pay your bills. Mm -hmm. They can overlook a lot of things, but no Jew, of course, in those days was ever a member of any service club. Mm -hmm. No Jew could become a member of Delaware Country Club. Mm -hmm. uh, we could not buy in Westwood. Mm -hmm. I know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and then when Charlie Bender opened uh, Kenmore, it was the same thing. He, mm -hmm. Restrictive uh, living, mm -hmm. those, were the, those were the real blatant mm -hmm. uh, areas, and they weren't directed uh, as... At, against anybody as an individual just because you were mm -hmm. a Jew. Was there any problem with the banks, getting money, credit lines through the banks? Would the banks... Make there, was never, there was never any problem with our family, with mm -hmm. my family, for the simple reason that my father was the youngest of two, of three brothers, the Schwartz brothers, both of the older ones were notoriously poor businessmen who mm -hmm. were constantly in trouble. Mm -hmm. And my father uh, was befriended, as it were, by Carl Esterly, who was at that time president of the old Merchants Trust and Savings Bank, which is now American National Bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carl said, Leo, that was my father's name, I know what the problem is with your two brothers, but I, uh, I'll go along with you. And my father was meticulous, and he recognized that he had to overcome not the fact that he was a Jew, but the fact that he, he had older brothers who were uh, not mm -hmm. good businessmen and not good uh, uh, credit risks. Mm -hmm. Another thing that my father had going for him, there was the, in those days, uh, there was a little fellow, I think his name was Johnson, I remember looking, I can't remember his, I think that was his name, Carl Johnson, I think, I may be wrong, who was representative of the old R.G. Dunn Company mm -hmm. before it became Dunn and Bradstreet. Mm -hmm. And he liked my father, and in the 20s, he would uh, do everything he could to send in uh, good credit reports. My father had nothing to start with. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a, maybe a couple of thousand dollars they mm -hmm. started the business on. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father was a very, very personable mm -hmm. guy, and everybody liked him very much that he, he dealt mm -hmm. with, and he was very straight. And uh, frankly, that's how he got going. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't uh, overcoming prejudice, it was overcoming poverty. Yeah. Uh, more than anything. It's typical immigrant, mm -hmm. uh, struggling kind of thing, but people who liked him and trusted him uh, gave him a leg up, gave him a, but of course he worked like a dog and he was paralyzed by the age of 47 and mm -hmm. just ran himself to death. 
Now, was there a Jewish community in Muncie in the sense of a neighborhood? Was there a neighborhood that was specifically identifiable as a place where most Jewish families would would be living? Well, I wouldn't say a specific neighborhood, but an area around most of them at that time in my day lived within walking distance of uh, the temple there on uh, Jackson Street. And Even though they weren't Orthodox, they would still... Mean well, of course, it wasn't living around that so much. It was that that the whole community pattern, you know, those were the days of streetcars. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when the automobiles started to become plentiful in the, in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the first Model A Ford, or Model T Ford, that uh, the family got. And that was a big business deal, mm -hmm. uh, so that my father and my uncle could, uh, that's my mother's brother, uh, could uh, travel and out to sea. But up until then, my father had done all his traveling by railroad and by mm -hmm. interurban. Mm -hmm. That's the way he saw people. Mm -hmm. uh, but to get back to your community thing, everybody... They could lived as close to the downtown area as possible, so you could walk downtown. Mm -hmm. And that was not a matter of uh, living in some kind of an enclave. There were never enough Jews in this town to ever live in in, in a, a specific neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I would say they lived within a maybe a twenty square block area, of particularly the downtown or what became the temple. Mm -hmm. Now in the in the early part, before World War I, most of them lived on the east side of town. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the whole community yeah. so it moved west. Mm -hmm. Were there any places in Muncie where Jews would not live? That is, by preference. We've talked about ones where they, well, they couldn't, couldn't live. Well, well, I suppose they would not have lived on the south side or mm -hmm. in uh, Avondale or Shed Town or mm -hmm. places like that. They Everybody tried to live... Uh, in accordance with uh, with his economic ability, I yeah. suppose. But that's not being Jewish. That's just being middle class. Right? That's being middle class. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It had no, nothing to do with. Yeah. Okay. Was your family religious, and how observant? I would not have called my family religious. Uh, I would say that. Uh, We we observed the major Jewish holidays. My father was well steeped in this, but uh, had a reasonable respect for it, but uh, was not particularly observant. Mm -hmm. uh, his main observances were to uh, observe the yard sites or the anniversaries of the deaths mm -hmm. of his parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, the and then of course the high holy days we would always be in in the temple then mm -hmm. and uh, of course the Passover mm -hmm. and those were mainly the kinds of home observances and temple observances that we had but we were not I would not call us a particularly religiously observant mm -hmm. we were not we didn't keep kosher mm -hmm. made no attempt to mm -hmm. let's see uh did you or your family belong to the synagogue or temple? Uh, oh, yes, yes, from the beginning. Uh -huh. What? Uh, now, am I correct that uh, membership in the temple is not necessary for religious observation? How significant was that regarded? Is it or isn't it, I guess? Well, from a strictly religious standpoint, Jews in this community who were never members of the temple. For example, uh, Max Ziegler, mm -hmm. uh, who helped many uh, businesses and factories get started here. There are great stories about Max Ziegler, but he, he was always a, an outsider. Mm -hmm. He elected not to. Mm -hmm. In the early days, a guy like Sam Gold, mm -hmm. 
I remember, who had a second-hand store down there on South Walnut. His family lived in the back in the early days of the store. And I am told, although I can't prove it, that Sam Gold couldn't even sign his own name. Or maybe, maybe that's an apocryphal story. Mm-hmm. But uh, he, I can tell you, was not a member of the temple in the early days. They were all, there were always a few mm-hmm. people who, who were peripheral to the, to the temple situation. Now, is your membership the amount you pay dependent upon some kind of negotiation or some kind of assumption about your role in the community? The assumption is based on your ability to pay. Okay, now, what was the assumption about your family? Were you top, middle, bottom? Do you have any idea? I'm talking about your father's. Uh, my my uh, observation is that my family were always assumed to have a lot more money than they really had. Now, so the assessment would be high? Probably. And uh, But uh, they were always playing the game, too. My, my, uh, my family were very careful, my mother particularly, about spending two cents. And as a result, uh, there was always the fiction uh, in the community that the uh, Schwartzes were much better off than they really were. What were the important values in your home? We talked a little bit about religion. Were there, uh, or the values that you had as you reflect on them? Would you identify them as being Jewish values, middle class values, Hoosier values? Is there any way of identifying these in your mind? I would say that our home values were basically middle class American. Mm -hmm. The great uh, stress put on the virtue of thrift, of work. Uh, the work ethic was extremely strong. Uh, learning mm-hmm. was, uh, that may or may not have been yeah. a, a middle class value. Maybe that was where the Jewish value mm-hmm. came in. That was very important. Mm-hmm. Emphasis upon cleanliness, take a bath every day. Uh, or not. Yeah, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, bodily cleanliness and mental cleanliness. Yeah. A lot of this, I suppose, would really, if I think about it, would have been uh, Protestant. Yeah, sounds Uh, puritanical. Puritanical, yes. Mm -hmm. I'd say that some of those values were. But um, there was an enormous emphasis in my uh, family on uh, personal integrity, that you don't lie, uh, that uh, you are morally straight, the kind of things that H.A. Pettyjohn used to teach us, you know, at the the YMCA. Right. Was Zionism or socialism uh, or any other organizational activity part of your home life? Now, these are the these are two two areas in which uh, intellectual members of the Jewish community would dispute. Now, to what extent did they permeate uh, Muncie or your uh, home? Certainly not socialism. My parents were capitalists par excellence before they knew what a capitalist before they knew what the name was <laughs> that's right yeah. they uh, espoused all all those kinds of values uh, my father having come from lithuania and having left the country uh, to come here for freedom was very very Mm anti-Russian and so the whole Bolshevik kind of thing uh, he was very hostile to uh, to that whole Mm -hmm. business Uh, I never had he was almost uh, passionately dedicated to the American ideal which Mm -hmm. I I believe that he had picked up as a young boy Mm -hmm. as I have reconstructed it. My father came out of that same uh, intellectual background that people like Ben Gurion mm-hmm. and uh, that mm-hmm. group in the 1880s on. Mm-hmm. And he told me that that uh, if his father had ever seen him, he'd have to go to the outhouse back of their house to read the modern then modern Russian novelist like uh, Chekhov or mm-hmm. Churgenev or anybody. Yeah. He said his father would have knocked him over Mm -hmm. uh, because a Jewish boy of his caliber should only study the Torah. Mm -hmm. 
see. But he was he was a rebel in that sense. Mm -hmm. And, of course, loved poetry and everything, and uh, used to recite it by the hour. But socialism, no. Zionism, uh, he was never, he never said much about it because it wasn't a big issue in, in our home. But he said, well, how can you not be a Zionist, any mm -hmm. Jew? You know, I mean, that the ideal was so uh, clearly embedded in these people from that background that there was no other solution mm -hmm. for uh, Jews except America, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, he really solved his problem. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get any feeling of a burning mm -hmm. issue, except it was sort of an automatic, well, how can you not be? Yeah, but Zionism is more of an issue with people who probably are in Europe, who probably are wanting to get out rather than... Uh, are you talking about today or then? Then. Well, I'm not qualified, really. Yeah. I, I, well, I don't know. Would, would there be people who would speak in the synagogue for Zionists? And would there be... Oh, no. No, not in those days, because reform, classical reform, which this you know. temple was in Muncie, was very much opposed to Zionism until the end of World yeah. War. I mean, the, the, the standard uh, position was an anti-Zionist. Only kooks, I remember, were considered Zionists, yeah. or active Zionists. Okay, let's go to the next question, which is kind of personal. Whom did you marry? Well, I married a girl named Helen Berger, uh, who I met in New York uh, after I was out of college. And uh, we are still married. What uh, was this person Jewish? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. What group of German immigrants did she come from? Sephardic, German, Russian, Polish? She didn't come from German immigrants. Her father, Berger, Murray, was born in Indianapolis, interestingly enough, and he's of Hungarian descent. When when would his family have come over? Uh, well, I think all of his, I knew all of his, his one brother and two sisters, they're all gone now. But they probably came over um, well they would have had to come over. I, I never thought about it. They're probably in around the eighteen eighties. Mm -hmm. Now Helen's mother was born in in uh, Europe. Most of their that family was and uh, uh one or two of the Children were sent over first, and, and then they'd keep sending after the other, another. And it was a very large family. That's uh, Helen's mother's family. Until they got the parents over, mm -hmm. and they were from uh, from uh, Austria or Austria, Poland, mm -hmm. and that and that what you know that kept moving Silesia, back and forth. That area there. Well, probably Galicia. Yeah, probably. Galicia. Right. Yeah. You're right. That's probably where they were from, although it's all very vague, you know. Uh, was this the name Berger, a family name? Is this anglicized? Or oh, no, no, that was the Hungarian name. That would be spelled that, with a U? B -E no, no, B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -R. Now, what it was in Europe, I have the vaguest idea. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, what, uh, well, I don't know Hungarian. Of course, the German Berg is a mountain, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Or town, which is. Oh. Tom, Ritz Mountain, right. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Well, now, was this arranged marriage? or? or is what, this... my marriage? Yeah. Oh, hell no, I met I her in a bar. It, I didn't think it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was sure not arranged by anybody but yeah. us. Was there any pressure by, uh, on your, on your, fa your uh, family's part to make sure that you met a nice Jewish girl? Did they make any attempt to arrange? Oh no, no. That it, wasn't but it was a it was a foregone understand uh, was understood when I was very young that that uh, while I went out with Christian girls all through high school and uh, I never I never looked to any of them as a married potential marriage partner. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's a little shocking to me when I think of my children. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it never occurred to me to that I would not marry a Jewish girl. Mm -hmm. But there was never any inclination that they would 
if they would help find the girl, they would arrange the marriage. Oh, no, 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 that was all. That's another generation. That was another generation. Uh, you're, you're no, past that. no, because after all, uh, Helen went to Wellesley and I was at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, we were uh, completely uh, absorbed in the American romantic ideal. Mm -hmm. And nobody was going to make any selections for us. But it was just as clear to her that she would only marry a Jewish fellow as it was to me that I would only marry a Jewish girl. Mm -hmm. That just never was an issue. Mm -hmm. Now, what about, is there any difference in your family with your sister? Were there any different expectations for her? Being a girl, you aren't as aggressive, and uh, maybe there might be more, more manipulation with the women. No, no, no. no she met a, a guy who was also Jewish who was a here. Ball State and ASTP during mm -hmm. the uh, during World War II, mm -hmm. and uh, she she married him. Mm -hmm. So, but there was never any question in her mind either. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this speaks about the larger Jewish community. When was the first intermarriage with Gentiles in Muncie, to your recollection? I remember. People coming in to Muncie in the 20s already intermarried. And, of course, that was a source of great consternation and shock, although it had no particular bearing. I remember the first guy that I can, I'm going way back, was a fellow named Harry Rittoff, R-I-T-O-F-F. -F. And he had a retail store, and he was married to a beautiful woman who I remember was a blonde, and uh, she was not Jewish, and that was a big. Mm -hmm. And I remember his mother, who used to cry to my mother and father about Harry and married out of the faith, you know. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any idea what. I remember other people like that, but they were um, kind of uh, social pariahs. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I recall it. I'm not quite sure. Do you recall anybody in your experience at the synagogue who was a member of the synagogue or whose family is a member who married outside the Jewish faith early in your early in your life? Mm -hmm. that, that, that wouldn't have happened in the 20s. Well, it was rare enough that it would have been a big event yeah. that yeah. somebody would have remembered. I have no recollection of it. Mm -hmm. Then when, when did it occur? 30s, 40s? Oh, I'd say after World War II it became uh, much more common then. That, then you would say? I'd say really in the 50s is when it really started to hit. Okay. After World War II. Mm -hmm. Why did it occur? Was it because of school contact, business connections, or lack of individuals of marriageable age in the community? Well, it's a good question, Dwight. I, uh, it's a good sociological question. My, uh, my feeling would be that it, there is a response to two or three changes. Number one, the weakening of uh, the feeling of religious or social, socio-religious ties. Hmm. The weakening of uh, any feeling of uh, that there was really a significance in being mm -hmm. Jewish, that it was nothing more than a uh, uh, difficult halter to be carrying around, and why bother in mm -hmm. a in this modern world? But that came about because I think there was such a revulsion in the world against the Holocaust. Mm -hmm that people said, you know, they're, they're, and I think these are unspoken things. I mean, I think this is the whole Western world felt that there was something uh, really uh, not only disreputable, but uh, inhuman about these kinds of differences. And I think that our whole society opened up mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen many of these things break down, these prejudices break down 
uh, myself since uh, since the World War II era. And I think that as a result, the children who grew up in this mm -hmm. era didn't feel the kinds of uh, affinity for the old uh, religious and ethnic and social mm -hmm. uh, ties that, uh, that I felt in my generation. Mm -hmm. I certainly know that my children don't seem to have that uh, feeling, and I think we do actually more religious observing in our home and have traditionally than my parents did. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Now, that's I've yeah. thought about it from those. I mean, yeah. I don't understand why, but I think it's a result of the larger, the total larger uh, changes that have gone on in the uh, mm -hmm. in our total Western society. When this intermarriage occurs, what impact does it have on the Jewish community? Would people marry a Gentile and then remain in the synagogue? I mean, this might happen with a male. Maybe his wife would convert. I'm thinking of uh, Mort Rosen. Well, yeah, well, there's a, there has been quite a lot, and and of course the whole reform movement, particularly in the in the last five or six years, has been taking a hard look at this and uh, and saying, you know, maybe we ought to revert to our old uh, uh, traditional role of being proselytes, which we'd always yeah. said that isn't yeah. our business. But uh, we have many uh, intermarriages in our little Jewish community now where. The uh, particularly when the wife is not born Jewish, who they have yeah. become very active in the community. Is that more typically the intermarriage pattern? A uh, Jewish male marries a Gentile female, or is it the other way around? The ones I think of, I think of Morton Rosenberg, Morton well, Roth, Mort Roth, uh, Jack Hertz. Yeah. Of course, that's a second marriage for Jack. Uh, Sid Zanger was married years ago. To uh, marry, they've all been active in the Jewish community. The women, on the other hand, there are uh, more and more Jewish women marrying mm -hmm. uh, Gentiles, and that in and men. And in that in that sense, I don't notice as much conversion among mm -hmm. the males. No, I would think that would be less. Likely. Although the males will uh, that I know are supportive, mm -hmm. at least overtly, of their uh, wives. In their religious activities, but they would themselves would not make an attempt. I, I haven't. I've seen one or two. Of course, I have a feeling about the conversions that I've seen to Judaism, both male and female. I, uh, uh, I'm very much. Uh, well, I won't say I'm hostile, but I'm very skeptical, hmm. uh, because I've seen this great passionate uh, attachment to this new religion, and then it peters out in a year or two. I don't see any. Uh, real continuity, except where there's a marriage. Yeah, and there's a tendency, I think, and again, my own prejudice, that, yeah. that the new new believer is more devout than the old believer. Yeah. And it becomes almost... Well, yeah, yeah, but if they remain that way, yeah. uh, that would be fine. My yeah. observation has been over the years that the, the, uh, the passion of the new believer uh, burns out rather quickly. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I feel almost about the people who come for conversion as I do about the cults, mm -hmm. that they're looking upon this in sort of, as sort of a cult. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and will fill all of their uh, lives. I talked to Jerry, um, you know, uh, what's his name, that moved to Indianapolis, you know, it was on the faculty. Goldstone? Uh, yeah, Jerry Goldstone about this, and Jerry is a pretty sharp psychologist and I said how come it seems that we get these kind of kooks that come and, and, and they, they really seem like kooks to me and they want to convert and they don't want to and they come and they they're very devout and they're not devout mm -hmm. you know and he said well we are a little this little Jewish community and the Jews in general are a very accept accepting group mm -hmm. and these people who probably are socially misfits mm -hmm in any other thing, really find uh, nobody's questioning them, and they find themselves reasonably comfortable. Mm -hmm. So they go through the motions of saying, yeah, well, maybe that's what I would be. Maybe I'll get comfortable mm -hmm. if I become what these people are. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're talking in areas that I'm really not confident mm -hmm. to judge, but I, I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I'm very skeptical mm -hmm. about this kind of thing, except where there's marriage and then there's, there's an an outside reason, not a uh, religious reason, to mm -hmm. join the group. 
What impact does intermarriage have on the Jewish community? Well, I think it has a serious impact. I think it's it's uh, it means the ultimate uh, erosion of the Jewish community. What else can you say? Mm -hmm. uh, intermarriage means that uh, uh, total assimilation, both religiously, culturally, socially. Uh, means the uh, the ultimate demise of uh, of the Jewish community. Do you see that the temple in 20, 30, 50 years will be gone? And uh, many small Jewish communities in this country have have uh, died out because mm -hmm. of that. I uh, I'd say it's a highly likely possibility. Uh, I don't like to contemplate it, but. Uh, while I'm alive, of course, or people that feel like me, of course, there will be some sort of a, an institution. I don't notice the, I don't sense the kind of commitment in some of the younger people that I see now that I think we had, but I don't, I think we had other pressures keeping yeah. us committed. Yeah. I it's, think they were anti Semitic. Yeah. It's an interesting commentary that. Yeah. Uh, that uh, the whole melting pot Americanization idea has been very much de-emphasized. Oh, yeah. And at the same time, it seems to be happening more and more frequently. That is, uh, nobody talks about it anymore. If anything, the emphasis is upon being ethnic and mm -hmm. so on. But at the same time, the way people are behaving is just the opposite direction. Exactly. The, the melting pot is melting. Yeah. And there is no question about it. However, in... And this may just be wishful thinking. If I understand anything about Jewish history, uh, these periods have come many times in our history when we uh, become fat and complacent. Mm -hmm. And then a big whack of anti-Semitism mm -hmm. always brings us back. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not looking for that, but we have lived in our lifetime yeah. through the worst yeah. in the history of the world. And... I have a feeling, as has often happened, that uh, yeah. um, I have a feeling that uh, there would always be what we call the saving remnant, mm -hmm. a handful, if you will, or a small segment of people who are devoted to the philosophical, the theological, and the moral uh, values of this tradition and will feel that it's worthwhile maintaining. This is the position that I'm at in my life now. This is not where I was when I was a younger man or got out of college. In fact, I question very seriously what these values were and why they would be worth preserving. Mm -hmm. And uh, over a period of 40 years now, mm -hmm. I have come to a rather positive, to a very positive mm -hmm. uh, feeling about it because I've matured, I've studied, I've had... Where and when did you become interested in your life, work, and profession? I must warn you, I've asked your mother the same question. How did you get into the paper business? Well... There wasn't much question with me. I think it was uh, an unstated assumption in our family that I would eventually come back to Muncie, whatever I did, and uh, go into the family paper business. Uh, so I don't ever remember any specific uh, discussions about it. I think it was just an assumption on everybody's part. Mm -hmm. That was the way I read it. And your dad was sick. And, of course, my father was sick. That made it even more imperative. And uh, that's what that's what we had lined up. And uh, that's the only thing I ever expected to do. Mm -hmm. Your mother suggested you might have made a good scholar. You a might have had boy. a good student. That he was a good student and might have made a, made a scholar. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was a... Yeah, go ahead. You were, would have liked to continue school. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I would have... I probably would have uh, opted for a life in academe, uh, at least at the outset. 
if I knew all the things that I know now about academia, I doubt it. Yeah. All my humanities experiences. <laughs> well, things may be going downhill. Okay, now here's a question that would take us all day, but uh, yeah, just what are some of the interesting incidents relating to your profession? That is, are there any things in your uh, life as a head of a paper company that would reflect upon the project itself, the history of the Jewish community? Well, everything <laughs> reflects, you know, it's, it's uh, like you say, we could go all day, but I don't know that there's anything in specifically uh, involving my, um, my business interests that have to do with, uh, that reflect on the Jewish, my Jewish interests, except that I suppose being a businessman in a sense has opened up certain areas to me, uh, but they don't necessarily have anything to do with the uh, the Jewish part of it. I well, let me ask you this I, question. I mean, it's not very specific what you're asking. Yeah. Is the paper business a business that has a lot of Jewish people in it, or doesn't have any? I mean, what what would you say? Is in the 1920s, when my father and mother started the business, there were lots of individual, individually owned Jewish paper distribution houses around the country. I knew an awful lot of them, particularly when I went into the OPA in 1940. So this wouldn't be an untypical business? It would not be untypical. It was untypical for a small town in Indiana. Mm -hmm. However, that is not the structure of the paper distribution industry in this country today. It has gone to, it has gone to large conglomerates, ownerships, and uh, I, uh, there are very few left, as there were in the 20s, Jewishly owned and Jewish managed individual companies. If you people will excuse me. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll You're going to get going. Ahead. All right. Well, wait. Let's turn that off a minute. Um, see you later. Okay. Then, then what's happened in, uh, uh, in the paper business has been what we've talked about happening in the retail trade, that the small entrepreneur has has sort of gone out to be replaced by larger groups, maybe part of a national group? Well, I think there are some similarities. Well, I don't goodbye, think Goodbye, gentlemen. All right. All right. Nice right. meeting nice you. Nice seeing you. Thing. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Um, I think the economics of the situation have governed more than, than anything else. Uh, it's no longer small business. It takes large uh, uh, in paper business. I don't know enough about the retail business. It takes large aggregates of capital mm -hmm. to uh, maintain these kinds of businesses. And um, frankly, the private entrepreneurial uh, ethic as far as I'm concerned in America, is not what it was back in the in the 20s and the 30s even. You can't start now with a couple thousand dollars. No, you sure can't. You've got to have it, and you've got to have know-how, and you've got to have a lot of other things. And this, uh, this business, while it's now almost 60 years old, is very dissimilar. It has very little in common with what it was. Yeah. It was a different kind of a. I could discuss that for hours, but that isn't what we're what we're talking about. Were you active in any Jewish youth groups? No, there were none in my okay. day. Around here. Mm -hmm. How active have you been in the Jewish and non-Jewish community? And this says, what are some of the positions you've held in organizations? And I think uh, we'll oh, limit well. you to twenty-five. Yeah. Well, you ought to know about me. Mm -hmm. I've been in all kinds of things for many years. Uh, I always was very active in every civic thing. Mm -hmm. You know, came back uh, after World War II, and uh, well, I was president of Muncie Civic Theater, and mm -hmm. I was on uh, I was on a Red Cross board at one time. I was a, for a while. I was on a, 
I filled an unexpired term of somebody on the uh, Chamber of Commerce. I uh, was always very, it was very active in the early days in the paper trade associations, both nationally and, and locally. And uh, in fact, I started these management seminars uh, back in 19. 53 and 54 at the University of Chicago and mm -hmm. Ohio State mm -hmm. uh, Long before it got to be a rather common practice mm -hmm. In fact, it was rather far out in those days mm -hmm. uh, I've done a lot of that. I've uh, oh, I've been involved in all kinds of things What about your involvement in Jewish organizations now? Well, of course, at Harvard and well, you know about the Harvard Center for Jewish Studies. I uh, I'm, uh, I'm now an overseer of Hebrew Union College, but mm -hmm. that that isn't a that isn't a managing overseer. They have a board yeah. of governors. They're they're trying to raise money, so mm -hmm. I uh, I accepted that with a full understanding that uh, I was not going to get into the fundraising business. Mm -hmm. If they wanted me uh, without that, uh, if I felt I could make any contributions, why well, fine. If not. Mm -hmm. Uh, it wasn't my bag. I'm not a uh, particular. I'm not interested in the fundraising mm -hmm. aspects. Although you can't get really into any voluntary organization, voluntary organization today without taking some look at it. Um, go ahead. Did any member of your family serve in the armed forces? Well, besides you. Beside me. Yeah. You served in World War II. Oh yeah. Anybody yeah. else? And I had stayed in the reserves, you know, until 1970. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there was. Well, I have no other immediate family. You no. got a lot of members of our family, uh, uh, cousins and mm -hmm. and uh, others were mm -hmm. very much into the armed forces. And, were, any, were any members killed while serving in the armed? Uh, the only one I can remember is a. Um, about a second or third cousin of my mother's um, from this Boston group or this yeah. New England Massachusetts group uh, he was on a carrier in the Pacific and I think they took a kamikaze mm -hmm. uh, someone this this boy was killed on it yeah. mm -hmm. Goldsmith his name was uh, San Sanford Goldsmith I think I'm, I may be well, I don't remember. That isn't the name. It's a, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, these next are about your children. Uh, how many children do you have? I have four daughters. How old are they? Well, they range in ages from 36 to 33 to 25 to Joni will be, and August will be 20. Mm -hmm. How many of them are married? Three of them are, well, three of them are married or were. Mm -hmm. Susie, the second one, uh, is uh, divorced now. Whom did they marry? Well, now what do you mean whom? You want to? They married men. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boys. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope. But uh, I mean the names and uh, whether or not they were Jewish. I guess right. that's the the uh, oldest one, Judy, married a uh, fellow named Andrew D. Ball, B A W -L, L, who uh, happens to be Jewish. Although uh, he never had nearly a, he never had as much Jewish background as uh, Judy did. Mm -hmm. They have two children, two boys. Both of them uh, are in Jewish religious schools uh, on Saturday and Sunday. Seem to be interested in Jewish things. Although I have no, they live in Potomac, Maryland, or in the Washington D.C. area, and so they have a lot more facilities. Yeah. Susie uh, is living in Dayton, Ohio. She married uh, a Jewish fellow, a very nice fellow, and has two children, a boy and a girl, uh, seven and four. But she got divorced last year or the year before, and uh, um, she's teaching school over there, which she has been doing for about five years. The children... Well, the little one is in nursery school. The uh, seven-year-old girl is in the Hillel Academy, which is a parochial school, a Jewish parochial school. And the only reason that she is in there is because Susie didn't feel that the 
Dayton public school system was good enough, and uh, she wanted a private school, and that happened to be mm -hmm. about the best private school that she could find. So that's that's where those kids are. Let me back up a minute. What about your oldest daughter? Does she work? Oh, yeah. She's My oldest daughter is a career person. She is uh, full-time with AAUW, American Association yeah. of University Women. She is, uh, I don't know what her official title is, uh, assistant program director or something like mm -hmm. that. However, she is uh, very much uh, into human uh, resources and systems and mm -hmm. uh, has now started to do some private consulting with some of the large American corporations. Mm -hmm. And I, my feeling is that she's going to end up into some kind of business situation like that because she's very much a go-go gal and that kind of thing. Now, what about your third daughter? Well, my third daughter, Debbie, uh, graduated from, well, all of them have, uh, of course, have, uh, well, the two oldest ones have uh, ABs and Masters. From? Uh, Judy went to Wheaton College. It's a woman's college in Norton, Mass., Got her A.B. there, and then she went to Tufts for, uh, she got an M uh, M.A.T., Master of Arts in Teaching mm -hmm. at Tufts. And uh, she um, had, uh, she did one year of uh, teaching at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School, and uh, then she did, uh, she was with H.E.W. in the Educational uh, Division. She did some work in adult education research, I believe. Uh, but that was always a little too slow for Judy. I mean, that was not mm -hmm. not her, maybe really not her bag. But I, my my sense is that she will remain a professional person. Mm -hmm. and, uh, her her family seems to uh, be adjusted to that fact. <laughs> okay. And uh, that's the way she looks. Susan has always been another go-go type. Uh, they're completely different personalities, but Susan graduated well. She had an earlier uh, marriage to a, a kook, I would say, a pathological alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And um, she ran out of the house at the age of 19, ran off and married this guy. And that lasted about a year, I think. Um, she came back and she did her master's at Wright State. Mm -hmm. um, so that's her situation. Debbie. Now, where is she living now? She, Susie, the second yeah. one is in Dayton. That's no, no, I mean teaching. Judy. Oh, Judy is the one I said lives in Potomac, Maryland. No, I, or, I'm, I'm mistaken. It's the third one I'm interested in. Oh, the third one. The third one is Debbie. Debbie is. And she's in uh, Lander, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. She is. Um, she graduated also from Wheaton mm -hmm. College in Norton, and then decided that she was going out on the simple life. Went out to Lander, Wyoming, which happened to be the uh, uh, base for the National Outdoor Leadership School. That's uh, where they go out and do mountaineering and other things, and they're going to learn life in the in the rough. And then she met this. Uh, young man out there. She didn't go through that course. She got hurt in the first five mm -hmm. days. And she met him out there and then uh, apparently decided that's what she wanted to do. And she came back east for a year. She worked uh, oh, up in New Hampshire, in, or in Vermont, Stowe, Vermont, as a ski bum one uh, winter. Mm -hmm. And she went back out to Lander and uh, married this guy, mm -hmm. who is not Jewish. Oh, okay. Is she she working or? Oh yeah, yeah. She's uh, worked ever since she's been there. She's very competent. Uh, she worked uh, first in a bank out there. This is a little town of about eight thousand, and now she's working for the hospital in the area. And uh, they were apparently surprised to find someone of her background. Uh, so they offered her either the business managership or the credit managership. And she said, well, she figured she'd better get on to it the easy way. So she took on the credit manager's job. And apparently he's doing very well. Mm -hmm. And they're offering her all kinds of incentives to keep her happy. Okay. And, uh, but I think that uh, 
there is a thread in all my daughters. They're all strong uh, individuals and uh, all doing their own thing, whatever it may be. Yeah. It sure as hell ain't my thing. <laughs> Okay, what are, these, are, these are the big questions and we're about to end. What are the biggest changes in your life? Have they been for the better or the worse? Now, I assume this refers to uh, your experience in the Muncie community and just general overall observations. Well, Dwight, I've spent a lot of time on, the, on, on this question. I made a decision a long time ago, along with my wife. We've been fortunate enough, we've done a lot of traveling, and we've been able to see a great, uh, great deal of the world. We have looked in other places around the world for retirement place or second homes or anything like that. And we made a decision about 10 years ago that uh, we would undoubtedly finish our lives in Muncie, or at least this is where we're going to call home. Mm -hmm. And it's for a very simple reason. Uh, here, we are known, we know the people in the place, and very simply, uh, we have status. Mm -hmm. And let's, uh, let's not kid ourselves. If we right. go to uh, Timbuktu or Florida or any place else, you're just another old, mm -hmm. has been an old retiree that's looking for something to do. Mm -hmm. And you know me well enough that as long as I'm able to function, I will be doing something. I will not use the term retirement because mm -hmm. I have no intention uh, of retiring. I don't know what to retire from. I have too many other interests. Yes, I'm not as active in the business as I was mm -hmm. or any of my business interests. I have other, you know, what mm -hmm. my sure. other interests are. So when you ask me, uh, this is my home. Mm -hmm. This is where I feel most comfortable. This is where I know my way around and where at least I don't have to uh, explain to anybody who I am or what I am. Everybody here knows knows mm -hmm. uh, who and what I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are a couple of questions about the Jewish community. Is there a Jewish cemetery or a section of cemetery? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is out in Beach Grove? In Beach Grove, there is a Jewish section, and, of course, traditionally, the first thing that any Jewish community would do when it began to sink any roots would be to establish a, a cemetery, which, of course, is hallowed ground. All right. And uh, there's, uh, the Jews are certainly not uh, uh, oriented toward the hereafter, but respect for the dead and for your ancestors has always been a very cardinal Mm -hmm. part of Jewish belief. So mm -hmm. there is that, and that was set up, oh, I think before 1900, if I remember the records right, because our congregation here is over 100 years old now. Now, is there a cemetery association that keeps those records, or is that in the temple? No, now? that would be, uh, and I, don't, I doubt that there are any records. We, mm -hmm. we should have a cemetery association, but there is no separate. It was mm -hmm. always just part of the congregation. We suppose they would have them at Beach Grove, right? You mean as to who's buried there? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, of course they have records mm -hmm. there. You can go out and on the tombstones and read Yeah, you can do it that way. Yeah. Okay, what uh, organizations do you have in your community? B'nai B'rith, Hadassah. Yeah, B'nai B'rith, uh, Hadassah. Uh, Temple. Sisterhood. Sisterhood. There's no Mimpa. brotherhood. Well, because B'nai B'rith takes over that yeah. function, you know. No Jewish war veterans? Not that I know of as a group. There may be individual members. Yeah. No, that, just the... the Organizationally, no. 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 That would about exhaust it, wouldn't it? Wouldn't be anything else that would be identifiable. Oh, there may be a... No, not as a going... Well, now, uh, organizationally, you would have the uh, Indiana Jewish Community Relations Council, mm -hmm. which is uh, the kind of thing that, for example, Marsha Goldstone now is the head of in Indiana. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, she has a professional job. Mm -hmm. uh, that, But that's never been a, a very... Uh, well, it's never permeated the community. It's been the kind of thing that I or Bernard Friend or Mort Paisel have always been very much interested in because I think it has a great deal to do with our activities as a group. Mm -hmm. Okay, the last question, and 
catch-all. Are there any incidents in your life which you remember vividly and which you'd like to recount which you haven't said so far? Anything that you'd like to add? Put in here. We haven't touched on. Well, now, when you say my life, you mean, uh, are you are you talking about vis-a-vis the Jewish issues or... Well, I guess this is open enough. It's it could open be. enough. It could be anything. Well, I have all kinds of interesting things you you know that I've I've done and and uh, been part of and been uh, on the periphery of. Yeah. But uh, a lot of them have been fascinating and interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them have been dull and forgotten, mm-hmm. I suppose. But I wouldn't know how to sum up my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, at this point, I have so many other things to do. <laughs> yeah, okay. but I, you know, I, I don't really, I hadn't thought about it. I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you know, many of the things that I'm involved yeah. with. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I haven't anything that makes. Okay. All right. Is that fine?